this offshore oil rig sailing through Seattle is heading to Alaska, and there could soon be many more like it off the U.S. coastline. That's because President Donald Trump has lifted a ban on drilling in more than 480,000 square kilometers of ocean around the country. This is a clear difference between energy weakness and energy dominance. And under President Trump, we're going to have the strongest energy policy and become the strongest energy superpower. Uh, we certainly have the assets to do that. The government hopes to cash in on the massive reserves of crude by awarding contracts to the likes of BP and Shell over the next five years. Restart Energy estimates the United States has 264 billion barrels of recoverable oil reserves, more than Saudi Arabia or Russia. Of this, at least 86 billion barrels lie off the country's coast in the outer continental shelf. The U.S. is currently the world's third largest producer of crude. It could jump past Saudi Arabia and Russia if it taps offshore reserves. OPEC has been limiting output to boost oil prices. Shale production from the U.S. is already upsetting that scheme. A surge in offshore output could completely derail the cartel's plans. The market has turned bearish with several key factors driving the sentiment. Reported compliance not matching export figures is one of those. Increased Libyan and Nigerian production is another. U.S. shale forecast is a third. Offshore drilling was banned during the tenure of U.S. President Barack Obama after the world's biggest ever marine oil spill at the BP-operated Deepwater Horizon oil rig. Environmentalists warn a similar disaster is inevitable if offshore drilling resumes. Well, offshore drilling is, is inherently dirty. It's inevitable that there will be an oil spill, um, such as was the case off the coast of Santa Barbara in 2015. It's inevitable that similar things will happen with this, and it will be even worse because the Trump administration has been working very hard to roll back um, drilling safety standards that were put in place after the Deepwater Horizon accident. But President Trump doesn't believe climate change is a global threat, and it seems unlikely that his administration will take note of the warnings. In the East, it could be the coldest New Year's Eve on record. Perhaps we could use a little bit of that good old global warming that our country, but no other countries, is going to pay trillions of dollars to protect against. Bundle up. The federal government still needs to consult the coastal states before it can sign deals with drillers. Once that's done, the U.S. may shake up the global energy market like never before. Be Nasser, TRT World. For more on this, our editor-at-large, Craig Capitas, joins me live from Paris. But first, let's go to energy analyst Stephen Shork in Villanova, Pennsylvania. He's the editor of the Shork Report. Uh, welcome to you both. Stephen, let me start with you. Um, how worried are Saudi Arabia and OPEC, do you think, by Donald Trump's latest plan? Well, certainly uh, there is a uh, point of concern here, especially given the impact that U.S. onshore shell production has already impacted the market over the past five years. Also want to point out that this isn't exactly a controversial move. The Obama administration was for offshore drilling before they were against it. And in fact, that administration did not make a formal blockade of the offshore drilling until the final two weeks of the administration. Mm. Trump said he was going to overturn this, and he has. Mm. But with regard to the fear that uh, oil pollution nations have, let's keep in mind, this is not a done deal. There has to be economic justification to make the cap investments in offshore production. And given where oil prices are now, I doubt there is much economic incentive to produce that oil. So at this point, I don't think there's anything to fear because the economics don't su uh, suggest we're going to see a surge in offshore production any time in the nearby future. OK, I'm glad you brought up the issue of how economically viable this is going to be, because um, I want to talk a little bit about the costs of getting this stuff out of the ground. How easy or difficult easy to get uh, oil out of the Pacific and Atlantic coasts uh, in terms of the marginal costs of extraction compared to the shale producers and compared to Saudi Arabia? 
Well, certainly, uh, production offshore, Pacific Atlantic, uh, no competition between Saudi and Shell. Uh, there, there's just no comparison. And the bottom line here is we don't know because we've been banned from drilling off the Atlantic coast for the last 40 years. So we don't know exactly how much potential oil is there. And we've been banned from increasing uh, offshore production in the Pacific for the past 30 years. So when you add on the unknowns, the cost of EMP, the cost of infrastructure, because there is no infrastructure. So that's going to have to be factored in. What also is going to be have to factor it in is the environmental groups. You know you're going to get a significant amount of lawsuits. So there's going to be tremendous legal costs. So the cost to extract barrels, mm. new barrels off the Atlantic Pacific, it's unknown right now, but it will be extraordinarily high. Mm. Right now in the North Sea, you need $65 a barrel to uh, likely make a profit in that drilling. And that is with infrastructure that's in, in place in a generation. Right. So that said, the cost to get the oil out of the ground will exceed well above $65 a barrel. So therefore, I am skeptical we're going to see any sort of surge okay. in the near time future. Um, qu uh, very quickly, Stephen, what do you think are the US's strategic aims in doing this? Is it energy independence or is it global market share dominance? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's dominance because I don't think the United States or any country, for that matter, could be dominant in any given commodity. This is simply a move to inc uh, increase security. We okay. have to remember how quickly this market could change. Ten years ago, oil was $150 a barrel. Yet last year, it got down to $25 a barrel, and that is because of the increase in shale production. So technologies and production changes this market in a virtual blink of an eye. If you don't believe me, just look what's going on in Venezuela. Hmm. Things were great 10 years ago there. They're not so great there. So this move, no, it's not about dominance. It's about security and stability. OK, we'll get back to you in a second, Stephen. But, Craig, I sure. want to uh, come to you, if I may. Same question to you, Craig. What are the US's strategic aims here? Well, well, first of all, Stephen is absolutely right. You can't be dominant in any single commodity. But that is not what the Trump administration is trying to do. It is trying to become dominant in multiple theaters that involve U.S. dollars. The oil sector is just one. What the Trump administration has done is it's weaponizing the U.S. dollar for its political purposes. There's a political incentive here. Stephen is absolutely correct that right now there's no economic incentive. But that doesn't matter to the Trump administration. We have seen him attempt, and the U.S. government over numerous administrations, try to control the dollar playing field. What Trump has just done in the past week, he's cut off $900 million of aid to Pakistan. Uh, he's, he has budget cutbacks at the U.N. He's penalizing countries financially that didn't back the embassy, uh, moving their embassy to the Jerusalem. The list goes on and on and on. Now, although a few hundred million dollars here and there might sound like an accounting error, you know, the idea of $900 million is more than an accounting era, uh, error in Pakistan. So what he's done, he has taken specific theaters of war and singularly... They don't amount to much, but if you put them all together and you look at America's attempt to control the flow and application of dollars, using the Justice Department as a cudgel, which allows them to go anywhere in the world to prosecute anyone with a U.S. dollar in their pocket, uh, regardless of where they are, if the United States believes... If, if the United States doesn't like how that right. dollar is being spent, okay. that's what's going on here strategically. OK. Interesting analysis there, Craig. Uh, Stephen, I want to bring you back in for one final question, if I may. How is OPEC likely to respond? Would they return to pump at will uh, that we saw a few years ago? Or are they going to abandon and abandon the restricted output regime that we have right now? Oh, I, th I think the longer you go out along the x-axis, the odds increase that you'll start to see greater production. We've already seen what Soviet, well, excuse me, Russian production increased to the highest level since the implosion of the Soviet Union. And remember, the uh, Russians were one of the biggest proponents of the cut. So certainly what you're going to see is you have to fight for market share. U.S.-backed, mm. that is to say WTI-backed oil, Brent crude oil backed oil, in indexed off that oil, is already starting to supplant OPEC oil to Asian refineries. So as that competition increases, yes, I would expect to see OPEC try to defend its ongoing market share. Right.
Energy analyst Stephen Shawk and Craig Capitas, thank you both very much indeed. <laughs>